Hi everyone. Hello. I won't introduce myself. <laughs> um, before I read what I wrote, um, I do just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I am not the public speaker. That is my brother in our sibling group, so bear with me as I uh, as I work my way through this. But we, we do appreciate everyone being here um, for all the love and support that we've had over the past year plus, um, even more than that, the entire time that Phil was sick, but even since he passed. Um, I know I respond to like 5% of messages that are sent to me. It's not personal, love everyone. I probably still won't respond, but please keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here we go. Dear Darius and Violet, your dad and I met on a study abroad trip to Israel in 2012. As you've already heard tonight, he was the life of the party. He was on the beach all day, out all night, and barely making it on time the days that we actually did have class. <laughs> Um, I think he had actually convinced his roommate, Jake, to bring breakfast to class for him every day so he could just roll out of bed and go directly to class and still eat breakfast. <laughs> um, however, no matter how tired your dad was, once he got into class, he was never one to nod off in a meeting or in a class, and I, that always impressed me. It didn't matter how tired he was. Um, once he was engaged in a moment, he was fully in it. One day, a group of us rented some cars, and we drove to the Dead Sea. We found a little beach, and we settled in for the day. I honestly don't really remember how we got to where we got. I think probably some beer was involved. But um, by the evening, Phil had sweet-talked his way behind the counter of the snack shack. He had commandeered the radio, was blasting techno music, and handing out drinks to everyone who came up to the snack shack. Meanwhile, he's behind the bar uh, drinking one coffee after another and uh, taking little dance breaks uh, from his newly assumed bartender role that we're still not sure how he was able to do or who paid for anything. Might have been you. I don't know. It might have been you. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I don't know about anyone else who was there that day, um, but when I think back to that, I remember how carefree and joyful it was. Hey, bud. <laughs> um, that evening, as we drove home, Phil had a seizure next to me in the back seat of the car. It was the first time that I had seen a seizure, and it was very scary. But thankfully, Phil had told all of us when we got to Israel that he dealt with seizures and what to do if one ever happened, so we were as prepared as you can be when something like that happens. Um, shake my way through this paper. Uh, Phil's doctor, Dr. D, is here and was probably cringing through that entire story because um, what I did not know then that I do know now is that a hot day at the beach with very little rest and who knows how many cups of coffee is pretty much a recipe for a disaster when you're dealing with epilepsy. So it probably would have been a miracle if he hadn't had a seizure after all of that. Um, but that said, Bill took a day to recover, and then he hit the ground running the next day. Um, it was rare to see him throughout the rest of the trip without a hookah or a coffee in hand. So he rolled on through. Um, for me, it was not love at first sight, um, but I was definitely intrigued by <laughs> this person that I had met. Um, to hear Phil tell it, sparks flew, and he knew that I wanted him, and I just needed a little convincing. So he did. He did that. And three years later, we were married. You see, your dad isn't what I would call uh, disciplined when it came to diet or exercise or things like that, but when he invested himself into something, he was fully in it. Um, Grad school wasn't just a degree for him, it was a passion pursuit. Work wasn't just a paycheck, as you heard from his boss, Anel. It was, it was this tangible expression of his interests um, and a source of pride for him. 
And D.C. wasn't just a city. It was a place filled with history and a place where he could be a part of history. And he loved that. And he has his tour guide group here that some of you may meet. He, when I was, side note from my written thing, when I was pregnant with Darius, Phil decided he wanted to be a tour guide and, um, and started taking classes so that he could uh, be a tour guide and tell people about D.C. And he, he loved doing it. He gave lots of tours of the Pentagon, and I hope that was sanctioned in the L, if not. <laughs> but he, um, he, loved, he loved doing that. So... Throughout your lives, you're going to hear plenty of stories about your dad on the dance floor, and it's true, he was a very good dancer. Um, but I think more than that, it was your dad's total investment in the moment and the people that were in it. Whether it was a great song on the dance floor, an engaging topic at work with colleagues, or a funny story over a beer with friends, Phil was 100% in that moment. And I think that's what people notice. When I met your dad in 2012, he had been living with brain cancer for nearly two years. I think sometimes people hear our story <clears throat> and they wrongly assume, there's like a whole pile of Kleenexes, that was smart. Um, and they wrongly assume uh, that I was brave to choose him despite it all. Come here. But the truth is that choosing to share a life with your dad didn't take courage. In fact, it wasn't much of a choice at all. He pulled me into his orb, and he showed me what it felt like to have a partner who was 100% invested in every moment with me. Someone who is willing to ride out the bad waves, but also seek out and hold on to every bit of joy that surrounds us. Okay. The truth is that no one in this room knows exactly when our story on this earth will end, or how, or even why. But some, like your daddy, have a bit more insight into the boundaries of our own mortality. They deal with a prognosis and treatments and side effects, and hope becomes this critical life source. So you see, I wasn't the brave one at all. Your dad was, <laughs> choosing to live fully and unabashedly, despite the hand you've been dealt, takes courage. Your dad's 10 years with cancer. During your dad's 10 years with cancer, he earned his grad degree, he fell in love and got married, he started a family, and he pursued his dream career, and he traveled and laughed and connected to others all along the way. Of course, your dad was human too. He experienced loss, disappointment, and frustration, but he never seemed to dwell on his illness. He always just accepted that as a piece of his story, but not his entire story. So I think your dad always knew something that I had to learn. When I think back to that carefree day on the beach in Israel, one could easily assume that the joy and the fun of the day were overshadowed by a pretty dramatic medical event that happened that evening, but it wasn't. These are two separate memories for me that are connected by an and, not a but. So Darius and Violet, I could speak all night about your dad, and I promise that for as long as we have together, I'll share everything I know about him. But for now, my hope for you, and I think that your dad's hope as well, is that you will engage fully in every moment you're given, that you never take yourself too seriously. <laughs> and that most of all, that you know in your hearts that just because parts of your story might be hard, it doesn't mean it isn't good. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, thank you again for everyone being here. <laughs> So, um, up next, we're going to show a little video so we know that um, many of you donated to the foundation and um, in Phil's um, honor, we supported some research at Duke and so this is the main, um, the head of the research team who is going to talk a little bit about what the money is going toward. Um, so you guys can hear a little bit more about how your donations will be used and then um, if you want to 
find Dr. D at some point. She's really good at translating things into layman's terms. So if you get lost in the telomere talk here, she it's could probably very long. She could <laughs> tell you about it. But we're really excited about the work that you guys have all helped us to fund. So you'll you'll hear about it here. Hello. Uh, I'm Kyle Walsh, and I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery, pathology, and population health sciences at the Duke University School of Medicine. I lead our neuroepidemiology laboratory and direct the division of neuroepidemiology in the Department of Neurosurgery. First of all, I want to thank Kate and Larry Loving for taking the time to meet with me and to discuss the research that my team does here at the Preston Robert Tisch Brain Tumor Center. Now, your commitment to funding brain cancer research is so very important to the work that we do especially funding the foundational research discoveries upon which transformative clinical advances and large NIH-funded research investments can be built. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to describe the research being supported by your philanthropic efforts, and I hope that those in attendance can appreciate the value that it will have for patients, families, and caregivers. My lab is deeply integrated into the neuro-oncology clinical practice at Duke, and we work to develop novel therapies for patients with glioma. But I'm an epidemiologist, and epidemiologists study the causes of disease. So given my training in genetic epidemiology, my lab has a long-standing and somewhat unique commitment to understanding what factors lead to glioma development and how these factors may run in families. Uh, much of this research focuses on genetic factors, which is to say changes to the A, G, T, and C letters of our DNA. Uh, we've previously found that genetic variants in genes related to telomere biology uh, are factors that can increase glioma risk, both within families as well as in the general population. But new, uh, very exciting research has found that epigenetic factors, which are modifications not to how DNA is written, but rather to how DNA is read, are also associated with changes in telomere biology. So telomeres are protective caps on the ends of our chromosomes, and, and they get shorter as we age. Uh, when telomeres are very long, uh, it can enable a cell to live longer, longer than perhaps it should, potentially leading to transformation into a malignant cell and eventually into development of a glioma. Uh, given the glioma diagnoses that were experienced by Phil and Noel, uh, we plan to perform the first study yet to investigate how epigenetic factors may contribute to familial glioma uh, and if this might be mediated by alterations to telomeres or telomere biology. Uh, support for innovative work in glioma formation can be hard to come by, uh, but it has clear benefits for understanding both who is at risk and ultimately, if this terrible disease can be prevented from ever forming in the first place. Uh, I really, really want to thank the Noel C. Loving But Tomorrow Foundation, the Loving family, and their friends for supporting this research that will hopefully inform on glioma prevention and help to improve outcomes for patients and families affected by this diagnosis. Hi, everyone. Um, I feel like I know a, probably a lot of you. In fact, uh, the ultimate four, I need to talk with you about something. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've been, the, I, and I promise you, Dr. Walsh it would have been, in fact, Phil Belf's friend. He's like an amazing guy. He looks so serious there, and it's hard to understand, but the research he does is very important. So, my name is Annick Desjardins. I was Phil's doctor uh, for 10 years. Um, and Everything you said about him is everything that I knew, but I knew him differently, and I wanted to share with you what he did for me. I'm sorry. So, I diagnosed my first brain cancer patient as a first-year neurology resident. I wanted to learn about the brain. I thought the brain was cool. It was the only thing that for me was challenging when I was in medical school. I felt like the heart was a pump, the kidneys are a filter, the brain was just, what is it, what, what is our brain, how does it function, what is the soul, what is all of that, I didn't know. And so that's what I wanted to do, neuro neurology. In the first few weeks that they dared to leave me alone in the emergency room, as a neurology resident, I diagnosed this young woman, 28 years old, which, who had, she came and she had those really, really weird headaches. And I got her head CT and I diagnosed with her with a brain cancer. Less than a year later, I was doing my pathology training when I did her autopsy. And I had to be the one going collect her brain 
And I was the one that had diagnosed her at 28 years old, had to tell her and her husband that she had brain cancer. And a year later, her body was just ravaged by the chemotherapy that she had received and the steroids. And I promised myself that I would do my best. So I decided to do neuro-oncology. So I'm a brain cancer doctor, which means that every day of my life I get bad news. And I'm sorry, Chris. I'm sorry, Larry. And but I decided that I would do research and I would figure out how to fight this tumor. 2003, I arrived at Duke. I had already been working in brain cancer research already for three years. I started in the lab as soon as the, my, I did the autopsy of my young patient. And I arrived at Duke in 2003. And I met Philip, Larry, Chris, and Noel on December 13 of 2010. One thing that I didn't remember, and I was thinking about that, checking back the notes, right, was I was not even supposed to be Phil's doctor. <laughs> in fact, I don't know what happened. So, <laughs> so in October, Phil had his first seizure in August, his surgery in September at GW, came to Duke in October, met with my boss, Henry Friedman, who assigned Philip to my colleague, Jim Vrandenberg. And then suddenly in this chart, I'm his doctor. And I'm starting in, I became his doctor and I don't know why. And I know why, but I don't know how. Um, and I was thinking about it and I said, how did it happen? And I know that what Phil would have told me is, it was Noel. Noel make sure that we would be working together. Everything we talked about was because Noel decided. So over the year, that what, what did Philip in his 10 years, what did he give me? He erased that memory of this 28 years old who died with a ravaged body a year later and allowed me to see this 22 year old become a 32 year old who went back to graduate school who had me become part of the family, right? Had him deal with going in to friends in Israel and everywhere he went and had seizure <laughs> and hit his head on cobblestone. <laughs> and we dealt with that and with, we laughed about it. He brought Kate and told me moving forward, this is my girlfriend. <laughs> and moving forward, any decision will go will be between Kate and I. And I was like, well, <laughs> you're young and you're sure. But <laughs> I trusted him. And he erased that memory, as Kate said, by living. By living despite his diagnosis, by going back to school, finishing grad school, getting married blessing us with Darius and Violet and giving us tons of laugh to the whole team and all of you and all of those memories. I have a great story about um, the Department of Defense. So I don't know if his boss knows that, but so, <laughs> so um, we had to put this device on uh, Philip to give him shot, right Kate? <laughs> so uh, to give him shot to boost his white blood count. So I, some of you might have seen the device, the Nolasta on pro site on TV, the day after chemo, you don't have to go back to your doctor, you can get this auto injector. So anyway, so we put this device on the back of his arm to inject him the day after his chemo, this drug that will boost his white blood cells. And so Philip calls and he's like laughing. And he says, so I'm sitting in the Pentagon and my device went off 
and it started beeping and flashing red. And he's like, I'm so scared someone will come. And like, so we laughed. So, so we laughed so much. We were just glad he wasn't in one of those meetings. So, um, but um, the other thing that he gave me is it erased this memory of this young patient. He showed me that li my patient could live 10 years. And now, by all the money you have raised, all this research that you will push forward with the foundation, it continues the feeling of Le Philip, like Janik said, right? The feeling of L Philip will continue to live with us and will help other families to someday not have to uh, lose a loved one. So, thank you. Thank you very much. First off, this gift would not be made, wouldn't be possible at all if it wasn't for each and every one of you making donations to the No LC Loving But Tomorrow Foundation. Uh, I'd like to recognize a couple of, I'd like to recognize Phil Staples. Phil, if you'd stand. Phil, is, Phil Staples is, was my son's godfather. And he's been especially generous to Phil's children, to college education, as well as to the foundation. I'd also like to just call her Dave Norris, who's been very generous to the foundation. And to all of you that are generous to the foundation, we thank you so much. And because of your generosity, it gives us pleasure tonight, Dr. D. We make a commitment in the check for $150,000.